of the C2 cars. Well, we are coming up now towards the start, towards that last corner, the three Porsches in red and yellow, the fastest cars in practice because, of course, they're turbocharged, they can turn up the boost, which means in practice they can go quicker, and Porsche always like to be fastest in practice. But the important thing is not who's fastest in practice, it's who wins the race. Three works Porsches versus five Jaguars, and the winner of the 1988 Le Mans is 24 hours ahead of us. As we come up to this last corner, you'll see the pace car pull off, off to the right up the pit road, and then the race will be on, and it's usually exactly at four o'clock. Today, this year it's a bit earlier, it's three o'clock because of the French elections. Off goes the pace car, 24 hours from now, we'll know who's won the race, Anthony. Indeed, the three, jet and three Porsches, of course, were fastest in qualifying. Hans Stuck did one of his flyers to take pole. This shouldn't be a disappointment to anybody because, as you said, they can turn the boost up in qualifying. They can't do it in the race because they'll run out of fuel. And the three Jaguars there behind the three Porsches. There are, of course, five Jaguars altogether, two of them over from America with Danny Sullivan, Davy Jones and Price Cobb. And then the other one, Kevin Cogan, the Irishman, uh, Daly and the Australian Perkins. Three Porsches still in line ahead on the first lap, and it's Wallach, number 18 in front, not Stuck, the pole man. You know, this is a big surprise because I think Stuck is going to want to reverse that situation. He will want to set the pace for the Porsche team. The interesting thing is, who's going to set the pace for the Jaguar team? I don't think it's going to be the Martin Brundle car. I would suspect that he'll want a hand back, so it may very well be that Jan Lammers, the Flying Dutchman, will do that job in number two Jaguar. Of course, the difference between that and the other Jaguar, Brundle and Nielsen elected to run with only two drivers. The, all the other Jaguars have got three drivers apiece. Lammers, of course, is with Johnny Dumfries and Andy Wallace. Yes, the important thing to remember, however, is that Brundle will probably drive second and take over the best-placed car if that car is well up, then he'll take it over. If the other car is well up, he might take that over. Once he's committed himself, however, he can't score points on the other car. We're in car now with John Watson in one of the Jaguars down the straight where the cars reach roughly 245, 250 miles an hour. And here are the Porsches and the Jaguar already among them. Yes, Lammers moving into third place, I think, splitting the Porsche team already. There he is. Wallach and Stuck ahead of him. The Andretti's behind him. And then his teammate, the number one car of Nielsen and Bruntle. Now, it's interesting also to keep an eye out for that other Jaguar there. That's the uh, number 22 car, the comparatively slow car in practice, but they're all up there in the first 10 or so, so obviously nobody's going to lie back too far. No, of course, they're very much part of a team. The Americans have come over from the American racing team of the TWR Jaguar team. Look at Lammers is now in second place, Neville. Yes, Lammers up to second place. I think of the Americans, the man to watch out for is Danny Sullivan. I don't think he's driven at Le Mans before, but he's driven in Europe before, and he's very, very quick still and very ambitious. And it's Stuck now in the lead. Stuck, number 17, has taken the lead with Lammers in the number two Jaguar second. Then the Porsches in third and fourth places. The Andretti car, driven by uh, Mario Andretti, his son, Mike Andretti, and John Andretti, who is, of course, uh, the cousin of Michael, the nephew of uh, Mario Andretti, who was a world champion at one time in Formula One and has won so many races in America, it isn't true. He wants to do the one thing that the only other driver has done is Graham Hill. He'd like to do Indianapolis, Le Mans and of course Monaco. And he's had a long ambition to do Le Mans with his family, with his son originally, and now of course he's got the nephew there as well. A dearly held ambition of this great driver from the States, Mario Andretti. In car, once again, as the Porsche comes out in the lead and it's Porsche first, Jaguar second, Porsche third and fourth, then another Jaguar. The three works Porsches are running with a slightly different type of engine management system. What's that, you might ask? Well, in fact, it's what you and I have, fuel injection, this sort of thing, and the electrics of the engine are all computer controlled. And that's giving them an edge over the privately owned Porsches because only the works Porsches have got that, and they reckon it's made up in... Lot of John Watson again. Dammer yeah. still in second place. And they've all closed up. Something must have got in their way. They've all closed up again, the three of them. It looks to me as if the gap indeed may very well have closed, Anthony. 
and the Jaguars in front, I think. Lammers has taken the leading Porsche. That means Volek is still in third place, but Stuckey is now second. This is really the Le Mans Grand Prix of tradition, isn't it? It really is. Jaguar in the lead. It's a hark back to the days of Jaguar and Mercedes when they fought it out in the first hour or so. And we're seeing exactly the same thing now with the Porsches crawling all over that Jaguar. They're not going to have, let him have it easily. Stuck in second place, a real fighter if ever there was one. And the Andretti Porsche is fourth, so the Jaguar was rather on his own at the moment, with the whole seething mob from Stuttgart on his tail. Yes, significantly the other Jaguars have not been able to back up this car. We don't know why yet. When we get the first pit stops, we may learn whether or not every car is handling perfectly, etc. Sometimes a car that handled well in practice doesn't on race day, and for no reason anybody can think of. But it looks to me as if very much the hair of the Jaguar team, and significantly quicker than any other Jaguar as a number two car. I think Jan was possibly helped by lapping slower cars. We saw them all bunched together, very close, and then we saw them down the further down the course with the Jaguar in front and I think as often happens the sort of lappery lottery may have come out his way this time. Yes he's a pretty uncompromising character when it comes to lappery and things like that. The Porsches fighting down among themselves behind him. of course that's exactly what Jaguar want. The harder they fight each other the more easily it will be for him to make a break. And this is the one thing the Jaguars are not doing as far as we can see is racing amongst themselves. They're letting Jan Lammers dictate the pace. Yes, looking back down the field, as I rather predicted, the one Jaguar that we've got to keep an eye out for is the number 21 car, the Danny Sullivan car. That is travelling very, very quickly indeed and is in up and among the Coventry cars as opposed to the American cars. Well, Danny Sullivan, as you say, of course, an Indianapolis winner and a real charger in any kind of racing and his teammates, they're a good team, uh, the, um, the Irishman of course, Daly, no sorry it's Davy Jones and Bryce Cobb, the other Americans. Davy Jones is very young, he's had experience in Formula 3 but he's not what you would call a very experienced driver. Bryce Cobb has had a lot of racing in all sorts of different categories, they're a very hot team that. Yes, David Jones, the baby of the team, in fact, at 23 years old. And here you see the Porsches charging after the Jaguar down the Mulsanne straight, 312 kilometers per hour. Would you like to do the arithmetic? I think you'll find it goes higher than that as they get a bit further down the straight. 366 we've got. And that is quick by anybody's standards. And the flag there to signify as if uh, nobody knew that somebody was coming up on a slower car there, but it's the slower car that needs the warning, and that's always the bugbear of Le Mans. More so perhaps in the hours of dawn and dusk than it is in bright daylight like this, bright sunlight like this. But nevertheless, the Jaguar you will see has got his lights on to warn the traffic that he is approaching, and uh, obviously doesn't want to be held up. The blue flag waved means there's a faster car behind you and you should give way. And the drivers of these huge 250 mile an hour monsters fighting it out for the lead here are very much dependent on the good sense and safety sense and manners of the drivers of the slower cars. Because yes. if they don't get out of the way, it could be extremely difficult. This battle is to look at this. This is still three cars and the Jaguar comes in the pits. First pit stop for Jan Lammers, number two, Jaguar. Yes, the Jaguars at the top end of the pits there, so they haven't got too far to travel when they come in, but they've got an awfully long way to go when they come out. And you can see the huge crowd as the refueling goes on. That's not a driver with a helmet on, that's one of the pit crew with a helmet on. There's a driver change taking place though. Johnny Dumfries taking over from Lammers, and these Porsches still seem to be fighting amongst themselves. Stock wants to get back in front of Volek. I really can't understand the team logic of that, but they're all very experienced professional people. I'm sure they know what they're doing people I'm sure they know what they're doing well I was talking in fact to the team before the race Anthony and it does seem that the Porsche drivers are more or less being allowed to drive their own race which is all very well but uh, if it happens at an early stage like this it can result in problems well again they'll be having to watch their fuel gauge if they, they'll be getting a bit of
a yellow flag period where everybody has to slow back if there's an accident. That kind of thing, which may, it's a gamble, it means you ease off on fuel a bit, but if you drive flat out like this for 24 hours, you're going to have some problems. Yes, every other Le Mans, since there's been a pace car situation, as two Porsches come in, has had a pace car out, it slowed the pace. of a change, and the other one comes across his bars and pulls it in front of him. It shows that they're a bit Volek, marginal on uh, fuel, Anthony. Supposing Volek's ready to go out first. I hate to criticise, and I'm sure I'm wrong, but this looks a bit of a muddle to me, Neville. Yes, it was a bit odd to have two cars in at the same time that early. And the second one in front. Yeah, I think the Andretti Parked car came in on its own, did it not, a little bit earlier on? I believe it did. This must be because one of them is a lap early, I should think. It's got to be. Meanwhile, now. soldiering on, having had a pit stop, refueled, new driver, in the lead now is Johnny Dumfries in the number two Jaguar. Yes, now the interesting point here is going to be, very significant I think, is how the pit stops actually went. Because if the Jaguar took on less fuel, he should theoretically come out with a lead. Yes, it's going to be to and fro all the time. These cars running so close together when they're on the track, that uh, a fuel stop's worth is going to be made up as you come out, unless, as you say, your stop is longer than the other chap. So Johnny Dumfries now at the wheel of the leading Jaguar, 28 years old, ex-British Formula 3 champion, uh, Formula 1 drive with Lotus, and then sadly nothing on the Formula 1 front, but last year drove for Mercedes here and holds the current lap record at Le Mans. Yes, I should think that lap record will probably go today. There goes Stuck out. I think he's got out first, possibly. Yes, and I think, in fact, that may very well be Klaus Ludwig that's taken over. Yes. I think they changed drivers there. Yep, it would be Klaus Ludwig second in that car, that's right. That's one of the Japanese team cars. Yes, this was interesting. Uh, the Japanese have often made their bid here at Le Mans, but they've never really uh, come home with um, any money in the bank, so to speak. And the big problem with the Toyota team, for example, is that they're very, very quick in practice because they can turn the boost up, but in the race they're very, very slow. Well, I think they virtually know that they cannot get through the race on the fuel allowance at anything like a competitive speed. I think it's as pessimistic as that. Well, here we see the battle. There's the Jaguar, there's the Porsche. The pit stops are over, the first round of pit stops are over, and we're back more or less where we started. They're not far behind, are they? And of course the traffic now is very heavy, the lapping is a problem, He's, you see uh, Dumfries has got a slower car between him and Ludwig, which will be to Ludwig's disadvantage until he get on a straight and take it. There he goes, but he lost a few seconds there. Yes, Klaus Ludwig, 38, 39 years old now, has driven extensively in America, drove for Zack Speed in saloons, has driven for Ford. And in fact, he's still driving for Ford in the European Touring Car Championship, a very quick driver and one of the very best sorters of cars. And here at Le Mans, he actually had two victories on the trot. He was going for his hat trick and decided that uh, the car wasn't happy, he retired from a race here and said he wouldn't come back to Le Mans after a big accident here a couple of three years ago. But when he saw the changes to the circuit, he changed his mind and uh, it's welcome back. Careful, Klaus. Well, he's certainly in a very competitive situation at the moment. Closing on Dumfries. Dumfries is quite capable of taking care of himself out there, but he will probably have set his mind to lap at a specific time. And if Klaus wants to go out and charge, well, that's up to Klaus to a degree. That's a Jaguar. That's a Jaguar that has spun. It looks to me as if that's the number one car. And John Nielsen, I think, at the wheel of that. Yes, uh, he's got well into the sand. Whether he's actually hit anything, it's difficult to tell. I think possibly he hasn't, but he's stuck in the protective gravel, which is designed to slow you down so you don't hit anything. Well, he's well and truly stuck there, and uh, the marshals are rushing to his aid now. Losing the... time, losing time. This is what you don't need at this stage. No, the regulation's very clear, though, because that car is where it is. It can have assistance to move. If it was somewhere safer, then it'd be up to the driver to restart it, but as it's where it is, and it's in the uh, kitty litter there, then they will actually pull it clear so it's not in a dangerous position and hopefully, if it hasn't hit anything, he'll be able to restart. Yes, yeah, so he's, he's well off the track, but he's not off to where the next accident might happen because somebody else could come off at the same place. So that is why, as you say, it's this in this dangerous place. Look at this fight for the lead. Ludwig right up with Dumfries. 
And meanwhile, I don't believe that. Oh, I think they had that at the first Le Mans, didn't they? I don't believe... What a lovely thing. It's amazing. It's a sort of lumber wagon. Yeah. It's been They're there for years. They're going to pull it out with that. Well, they obviously. are, too. They are. What a lovely machine. A thrill for the driver sitting there watching the cars go by. He's yes. got a grandstand seat. And now, of course, he's facing the wrong way. So somehow or other, safely, he's got to turn around and come back in the direction of the race as they rather leisurely unhook him. And then, of course, he's got to decide whether to go in the pits to see if there's any damage or if he's picked up any gravel which might upset the cooling system or anything of that sort. John Nielsen, the Danish driver of the Jaguar, unusual for him to make a mistake. Yes, we should tell you, as if you didn't know probably, that the man who runs the Jaguar team has been responsible for the Jaguar effort here at Le Mans. Their comeback into sports car racing, their win in the European Touring Car Championship is Tom Walkinshaw. Mm. Tom Walkinshaw is a tough, hard Scotsman, and I wouldn't want to face Tom Walkinshaw after I'd done that to one of his cars. Well, let's hope he doesn't have to face him. If the car's not damaged, he can go straight on anyway, and they're sweeping up the general mess that he's created. There's the camera again in the number three Jaguar, showing us just what it's like for a driver. Look how smooth and steady that car is. No bumps, no vibration. It's like a saloon car on the motorway. Yes, that was on the Mulsanne straight, and you know when they put that surface down, they laid it with lasers, Anthony, so it's so smooth, and in fact it was so smooth that it actually affected a lot of people uh, when they came to set the cars up. Now, John Nielsen has not stopped, he's gone straight by. So, the curiosity of his teammate Martin Brundle as to whether the car is damaged or not, and where he's been and why, will not be satisfied for the moment, except on any radio communication he has time to make. Yes, he probably by now has had a chance to assess that there's no damage and he'd rather stay out there and get on with the job than have another stop for no apparent reason if it is OK. Interesting point, of course, the pit signal, although they have radio communication, the pit signals, of course, are not given from the pits. They're given from a special signalling area right down the other end of the track after Mulsan, uh, which is controlled by radio from the pits. Yes, of course, you have an enormous number of marshals around this circuit, but you also have an enormous number of people helping in the teams. I can't remember how many people is it the Jaguar have got here altogether. Oh, well over a hundred. And, of course, they've got caterers and physiotherapists, doctors and goodness knows what. This battle for the lead is still hot. This is like Ludwig is not going to let Dumfries get away, and Dumfries, who's not enormously experienced in this kind of racing here, is really putting on a fight and holding him off. Yes, Johnny Dumfries' first drive for the team was at Spa at the end of last year when he significantly dented a car. Um, but having got it undented, so to speak, the Jaguars went on to win that race and clinch not just the drivers but the manufacturers' championship all at the same time. Well, he's holding off one of the toughest drivers in the business, Klaus Ludwig. Look, there's nothing between them. Nothing between them. And he's coming alongside and he's taking him. He's turned up the wick on the turbo and taken the lead. happened last year and of course when that does happen it's very very serious indeed because all the aerodynamics go on the car fortunately it's gone well clear of the track right over the other side so that particular tail section of something has not done anybody any harm there's the car that lost it it looks like a c2 car yes it is a c2 car and what's this it's the porsche the this porsche is, is slowing it's Lars ludwig do you think it couldn't be anything done. to do with the fact that he was going so hard and using so much fuel. I think you might have read that right. I think that, in fact, we could have a situation where Ludwig has stayed out perhaps one lap too many, and he may very well be out of fuel. Now, it's absolutely critical that he gets that car back to the pits, because if he doesn't, that's it. There will be a Porsche out. But he meanwhile, can, it's losing a lot of time. He can coast on the downhill bits and possibly drive it on the starter motor while the battery lasts on the other bits. But I think, as you say, I think he's done one lap too many, all gone a bit too hard, one or the other. He's a small pocket-sized battleship, but you know, Hanstock and Derek Bell are very much bigger chaps, and I wouldn't want to be telling them about it, not even <laughs> over the radio. <laughs> yes, this is losing a lot of valuable time. He's made the pits, at least. He's made the pits. Now, at this stage, again, I think he'll be allowed to have assistance to reach the pit, because they don't want a car stuck in an awkward place. So I think on safety grounds, if no other, there they go the Porsche mechanics in overalls to match the car, and one of them hurriedly talking. A 
and he says, fuel, no fuel. Then, well, whatever the German fuel is, I can't remember at the moment. I can't know. Benzene, isn't it? Benzene or something of the sort, but whatever it is, uh, he's not going to be a very popular man. Popular man. Well, now that, of course, means that the lead Jaguar will pull away because the other Porsches were nothing like so close to it. This was the one that was biting the Jaguar's ankles. If Jaguars have ankles, I suppose they must do. And so it's pulling away now and building a nice big cushion. Because from a Jaguar point of view, it's the right Porsche that has overrun this fuel problem. Now, I couldn't see whether they changed drivers there or not. Did no, you I'm see sure that? they didn't. I don't no, think, I don't they, think did. they did. They wouldn't be uh, because it would be... Uh, possibly out of schedule. Yeah, so Klaus would be staying at the wheel. which with um, Van Schuppen, Australian, Van der Merwe, South African, and Bob Wallach, Frenchman. There's the leader. And that, I think, is the battle for the lead all over again. Yeah. Looks like it to me. That's Andy Wallace. And closing in on Andy Wallace now, the Porsche after its pit stop. And let's see whether Andy Wallace gives the Porsches as much trouble as the other two drivers in that same car did. I think that's probably Cyril van der Merwe, the uh, South African in the number 18 Porsche now in second place. He's really having a go at Wallace. 42 years old, van der Merwe. Drives sports cars and drives them very well. And is driving this one back into the lead on Abs the 1988 Le Mans 24 Absolutely wheel to wheel down the straight. Yes, he has got him. For a minute I thought Wallace was going to hold him off. But he's now right in slipstream. He's going to come and do him back again. It's almost like the first years of disc 